day. Today is Monday, April the 8th, 2013, and we're interviewing Tony Tenehero at the Greater Long Beach Chapter of the American Red Cross. Mr. Tenehero is 59 years old, he'll be 60 this month, having been born on April 28th, 1953. My name is Phil Wendell, I'll be doing the interview, and assisting me will be Carol Act. This interview is being done for the Greater Long Beach Chapter of the American Red Cross in conjunction with the Library of Congress and the American Folk Life Center. Mr. Tonado served in the Air Force during the Vietnam War and finished his rank as an E-4 sergeant. Uh, first and foremost, Tony, I want to thank you for your service to the country and what you did. We want to get your story. I want to have you go back when you were a kid growing up. And what, do you, what do you recall where you grew up, where you were born, what your parents did, your mom and dad, and your siblings? And we'll kind of just kind of go from there and work our way through, through time. Um, I was born in Boyle Heights, California, on April 28th. I think it was about 2 o'clock in the morning, and uh, I think we, well, first I think we lived in a grocery store that my parents owned, and uh, we had a little room upstairs where we lived, and uh, we also lived in City Terrace, and uh, I have uh, three sisters, uh, Maria is older than me by one year, uh, Dolores is uh, my middle sister, she lives in Arizona now and Maria lives in Texas and uh, Carol, the youngest, she has her family and uh, lives in East LA. So you're number two in that pecking order then? Huh? <clears throat> okay. And my brother Rene, um, my middle brother, uh, he died in 1990. And my dad was a uh, flying tiger, oh. and my mom was uh, pretty much a homemaker, and she also uh, was an auto republic. Did your dad speak very much about the flying tigers? No, he, he almost never ever talked about uh, no, what he did in the war. Well, and he, he, he probably, was a hero too then. Pardon? He was a hero. He was flying, flying, flying tigers. Uh, P-40 Warhawks. They right. I think he started out... Um, as a um, flight engineer in uh, B-25 uh, Mitchell bombers and then uh, went to uh, B-29 Super Fortresses as a navigator, no correction, bombardier and uh, flight engineer. And then he joined the American Volunteer Group. And somewhere during that time he also um, played football and baseball, and uh, see, he was born in El Paso, my mom in L.A., and my dad came from a huge family, and uh, my mom only had uh, one brother, I remember, uh, Miles Pete, he was uh, Army Infantry Mountain Occupations in Korea, and from um, City Terrace, we moved to um, Silver Springs, Maryland when I was in the 8th grade. <clears throat> and uh, my dad was in uh, politics. Mm -hmm. And he was active with uh, OEO, Office of Economic Opportunities. And we lived in Silver Springs for one year. I was a, a Boy Scout at that time. And I went to St. Cabell's Catholic uh, grade school. And that's where I was uh, confirmed. And my confirmation name is Peter, uh, who was known for having a temper, which uh, means that I was happily named. Uh, the only time I really blow up is uh, if I um, if I see some somebody doing something stupid, especially um, at the expense of um, um, defenseless, the defenseless people, children, or uh, elderly people, or uh, people not of my gender. Or if I think somebody's uh, threatening Anita, my fiance. Otherwise, I'm usually pretty easygoing. Uh, from Surf Springs, we moved back to Los Angeles, where I was in the uh, 
say I went to three uh, high, three, correction, four high schools. I started out in uh, Loyola High School in L.A. Uh, as a freshman, and I lasted one one uh, semester <clears throat> because I was active in scouting and, and uh, civil air patrol, and the paleontological society in school, uh, booster club, drama, speech and debate, football. Um, volunteer work, and the Jesuits take a very dim view of people who don't study enough, so so they invited me to go somewhere else, and so I matriculated at Camwell High School in, I don't remember, Montebello, I think. I did well there because I focused on my studies, and then uh, after my freshman year, our family moved to San Antonio, Texas. And I went to Antonian High School. At that time it was a boys' high school, now it's co-ed. Um, the brothers who ran the school were um, strict. <clears throat> uh, there weren't any school police at the time. <clears throat> and um, so the brothers maintained order. In one case, we were um, waiting for Spanish class to start, and Brother Brendan, who is um, a little shorter than average height, very um, mild-mannered, was a little late for class, and uh, we found out why when we heard uh, some banging going on outside the uh, classroom. Uh, one of the boys had uh, pulled a knife on him, and Brother Brendan uh, had um, pushed him back forcefully against the lockers and took the knife away from him and then um, once that was uh, calmed down he, he came in unruffled and um, proceeded with Spanish class like nothing had happened. Yeah, I don't think we ever saw that boy again. Another time our choir director, uh, Brother Wayne, uh, 20 years old, little pot belly, balding, was up on the stage when we were practicing in the auditorium. Uh, we were called the Apache Men's Choir, and uh, a couple of the boys were cutting up um, uh, in the seats, and uh, Brother um, Wayne called the troublemaker up to the stage where he decked him, and uh, that's the way it went. Uh, they um, they were firm. They weren't uh, they weren't uh, cruel to the boys, just uh, very firm with them, and. Um, that's where we learned uh, to uh, try to be um, well-mannered and to uh, to be studious because they never let us get away with anything. And I was pretty much, um, well I've always been a, uh, a reluctant um, I've always been a reluctant uh, extrovert, and I've always liked uh, being a loner. And uh, I did better in school if I didn't have to uh, uh, try to be um, be popular or um, mingle with the crowd. And uh, I wasn't very good at um, succumbing to uh, peer pressure. And as long as I was left to my left to my own devices, and not pressured by the other kids to uh, do what they like to do, uh, I did pretty well in school. I know that you like Texas, San Antonio. I liked it very much. Okay. So I lasted two years through my junior year, and then um, I started playing football and doing those other extracurricular activities again. So. I was invited to go to another school, so my fourth school was Douglas MacArthur High School, public school. My first public school. Still in San Antonio? It's still in San Antonio. Football's big back in Texas. Yeah, it sure is. And uh, I was offered scholarships to six universities. Um, but I didn't, didn't realize the value of um, scholarships and uh, uh, pursuing a higher education, so I decided to go to junior college. Who gave you the offers for the scholarships? One of them was Rice University. Okay. Quite school, yeah. I don't remember the other ones. 
And um, after about a year of being a um, music major, I got bored with it. And, uh, still in San Antonio? Still in San Antonio. Okay. I got bored and uh, I got tired of my, my parents uh, bickering all the time. My dad, uh, uh, being, he was uh, a little rough on my, uh, my mom and the girls. <clears throat> and now that I think about it, in retrospect, uh, no, that was a, um, a manifestation of his post-traumatic stress. But uh, during the uh, Second World War, um, they didn't know about uh, PTSD, so um, it couldn't be treated. <clears throat> so he was um, the kind of veteran who uh, would um, hold things in and uh, just let them uh, fester, and uh, then he'd blow up at people in the family. Otherwise, he was well-known uh, and well-loved uh, outside of the family for being um, uh, generous and... Um, and uh, Always, um, I had jokes to tell and uh, got along well with people. And he passed away from a uh, coronary at uh, Long Beach Naval Hospital in 1986. Uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So from Texas, uh, while I was there and uh, I had finished high school, I spent uh, that one year at uh, San Antonio Junior College and out of boredom and out of a necessity to get away from a, a family strife, I joined the Air Force at age 19. Now, were you draft eligible then? That's back <clears> in <throat> 73, right? Yeah. Okay. But I don't remember if I was, um, I, think, uh, I think my number was such, I don't know if it's low or high, but I was exempt from the draft. So I volunteered. And because my dad had been a flying tiger and I admired him very much for that, uh, I decided to join the Air Force instead of the Navy. Okay. And they said welcome, huh? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Um, I'm probably uh, one of the very few um, inductees who um, uh, just waited at home for a, an Air Force staff car to pull up and uh, drive me to, to uh, Lackland Air Force Base. Uh, seemed like everybody else got off the buses coming from uh, other parts of the country. And uh, I got off of an Air Force staff car and uh, then I got in line with everybody and where um, the training instructors started to uh, yell at us. They, they dropped the, uh, the uh, I'm your buddy veneer and uh, introduced us to the uh, Air Force with all the yelling and the, uh, and the brow beating and uh, everything except for violence. How did you feel about that? No, my dad was uh, pretty rough on me, and uh, he was a um, perfectionist. <clears throat> Nothing I, I did was right when I was growing up, and it was rare that he praised me, so it was um, almost like being home. How long was boot camp? Uh, normally it would have been six weeks, but for me it was something like nine weeks. Why was that? I may have been uh, the mascot of our flight, uh, or the squadron, uh, 2709th um, BMTS, Basic Military Training Squadron. Um, when I was uh, an infant, my mom was t carrying me out of the car, and she accidentally slammed the door in my right hand that uh, broke my finger. And uh, when I was older, I didn't want the finger broken and reset because I would never be able to bend it. So it stayed like this. So when I saluted uh, the first time, the training instructor um, at, told, reminded me uh, in front of everybody that I was not of the Boy Scouts. And um, he just started picking on me all the time. And uh, it was a little embarrassing, but I, I thought nothing of it, really. At least I thought I didn't think anything of it. But one day during mail call, uh, everybody was running towards the uh, day room for, for a mail and our training instructor, Sergeant Ralph Morassi, or tech sergeant, um, Lacklands answered Little Caesar. <clears throat> it was uh, standing in the latrine door 
looking to see if there was anybody lollygagging the, uh, in the latrine, and he had his hands on his hips, and his back was to me, so as I ran by, I put my hand on the small of his back and gave him a hard shove, and went running against uh, the far wall. And he knew who he was, who, I, who did it to him. So uh, I was invited to go to a um, motivation squadron. And uh, right before I left motivation squadron, uh, Sergeant Morosio took me aside and told me that I had the best military bearing he'd ever seen, which puzzles me. So I went to motivation squadron, and uh, when I left there to go to my deal, what, what happens in that kind of squadron? They try to teach you to be more motivated, not uh, not uh, cut up all the time. Or, you know, people who go there are the ones that get in trouble and are given a second chance. So uh, we had a march. Um, pardon the phrase nut to butt. And uh, we had to stamp our feet when we marched. It was a little, um, little stuff they, they regularly go through in Army or um, Marine training or Navy training. But for us it was a little stricter than uh, regular basic training. And we had to scream yes sir every time we were given an order and uh, whenever I spoke I uh, had, had to ask permission to speak first. I had to be addressed and then ask permission to speak. And then um, sir came, the, was the first word out of my mouth and the last word at the end of each sentence and I was always at attention. And um, I had a run in with uh, another trainee. It was over something very trivial. We were folding towels and he threw a wet towel in my face and uh, just walked right over and talked to the uh, training instructor about it. And uh, he questioned us both. And uh, the trainee who um, started it all just talked, just answered all the questions uh, like he was um, holding a normal conversation to me while I, I do the whole thing. Uh, sir, Ermantine Harrow, request permission to speak, sir. And uh, speak, Airman, yes, sir. Sir, this happened. Sir, that happened, sir. And so I got along uh, fairly well. And uh, after motivation, I was um, walking down the road with my duffel bag on my way to my new training squadron. And somebody uh, looked out the door of the orderly room and said, are you Tina Harrow? And I said, yes. And he, uh, he told me that Big Red said to tell me that uh, I had the best military bearing he'd ever seen. Big Red was the uh, big red-haired uh, master sergeant training instructor. But it wasn't really that hard of training. Just uh, just meant a little uh, a little more adherence to the rules and uh, paying attention and uh, playing the game. How was it being gone from home for like a time period? Didn't bother me. Uh, it says in Proverbs, um, better a uh, a crust in harmony than a feast in strife. So it, uh, I felt I felt better off uh, being away from all the uh, all the um, bickering and. Uh, even though we ate well and uh, we were, uh, we got everything we wanted as kids, still I would rather have uh, just had a little piece of bread and uh, in harmony and peace. Well, I got along well, and then we dream, filled out dream sheets. On dream sheets, I'm getting ahead of myself again. <clears throat> During uh, basic. Uh, six of us were um, separated from uh, the rest of the training squadron, and uh, I found out later we represented uh, the top 50% of the IQ in the squadron, and they marched us to the OSI building, up to Special Investigations, to fill out top secret questionnaires for um, uh, classified jobs. And I was engaged at the time, and uh, I called my fiance on the payphone while we were taking a break and uh, she uh, she decided to um, get married to uh, to the boyfriend who she had broken up with and that's how she and I got together and she left my car with all the things I gave her parked in the front of my parents house and uh, I was a little um, down in the mouth about it and a training instructor um, asked me about it and I, uh, I told him what happened and he told me, uh, well, that's just, that's okay. Um, just, um, <clears throat> just put down the training or the questionnaire 
that you uh, smoke marijuana and uh, you won't have to uh, uh, go into this classified job. And uh, it turns out he was blowing smoke at me. And so I did what he said and, uh, oh, that's right, um, be this was before the phone call, the um, fateful phone call to my uh, fiance uh, when I uh, when I wrote down that I had used marijuana and so I didn't have to uh, worry about going to Vietnam and sitting in a rice paddy and shooting uh, my own people who came near my radio equipment. And then after, um, after I found out that she didn't want to get married to me anymore and I wanted to go, uh, that's when I was told that, uh, that uh, I, I couldn't go to the training and go overseas uh, because I had smoked marijuana, ostensibly smoked marijuana. So uh, they told me at the OSI building, uh, just keep my nose clean and uh, maybe I'll have another chance. So I filled out a dream sheet, uh, writing down my three preferred assignments. One of them was uh, security police, another one was, um, I forget, and the third one was uh, to um, be a recreation specialist. <clears throat> so I wound up um, going to Norton Air Force Base in San Bernardino and uh, instead of being a rec specialist, I was an audio tech. And I thought for sure I'd, um, I'd finally be away from my family. But shortly after I got to my new base, um, they moved to L.A., so it uh, didn't work out the way I planned. So you were away from home for what, about nine weeks before you had a break to be able to go home at all? Oh, no, it was during boot camp. Uh, around oh, okay. See, I, I went to boot camp uh, January 1st of 73. Um, and we were given leave, um, just a day pass, so I went home and visited my family. And, um, How was that? Well, my middle brother, the one who died, uh, he was um, he was already a rebel, and um, uh, he was a pretty big kid and uh, acted tough all the time, but when he saw my short hair, um, uh, he started to cry and walked away. I don't know if he felt sorry for me, why he, uh, why he felt that way, how he felt. But I had a good time, and uh, I showed him how many push-ups I could do, and I uh, lost a lot of weight. It was fine, then I went back, and uh, I was actually glad to be back at the base. Then you came west of Norton, huh? Yep. How'd you get to the audio business? <clears throat> I well, did that, I guess. Huh? Right, but before I, um, before I was um, sent to my assignment, <clears throat> uh, they had what's called casual. Casual meaning um, they have to find something for for you to do uh, before they uh, or while they're cutting your orders. So they assigned me to be in charge, full charge of a um, barracks uh, full of mentally ill airmen were being discharged and they, they were waiting to be discharged. So I was in charge of them and I was uh, just a um, six-sleeve uh, airman basic. No training at all, but I, they felt I did pretty well at that. And so when I finished that, I went off to Norton. What did it evolve when you were supervising these people? Waking them up uh, for a dorm guard duty, uh, uh, I guess it was at midnight. And uh, just making sure that if uh, if anybody was um, causing any trouble, to report it and uh, try to keep order and uh, try to keep them calm, and that was pretty much it. Okay. Sort of like a um, security guard, you know, observe and report. So I thought that was a pretty good experience. Because uh, later on, based on that experience, while I was in college, I worked part time as a drug and alcohol diversion uh, counselor. So you came back to Norton then? What did you do at Norton? Uh, I was an audio tech, which meant that I drove forklifts in a warehouse. Uh, my official title was uh, audiovisual media specialist. 
so I was trained on the job to um, uh, take care of audiovisual equipment and set up meetings and conferences, which I never did. I was actually assigned to a, a film warehouse, uh, 75,000 uh, prints of training films, and uh, I pull them out of the um, off the shelves and uh, take them to shipping and receiving. And when they they come back from wherever they went overseas, I put them back on the shelves using computer printouts and uh, drive trucks and forklifts and. Uh, go on um, courier runs to Hollywood uh, to take um, audiovisual equipment to be uh, repaired and bring back the equipment that was repaired to the base and uh, do some shipping and receiving and film inspections and film repair. And uh, I was also a, um, I babysat a Zoomie. Zoomies are um, what they called Air Force Academy cadets and during that time there was a program uh, whereby the Air Force Academy would send um, cadets to different air bases <clears throat> and each of them would have a sponsor and uh, each Zumi would uh, live with his sponsor and work alongside of them and um, go out and eat have fun afterwards after work and um, the, the difference was that they had to wear their blue uniforms with the epaulets and um, little um, stripes on the epaulets. And uh, we wore our um, green jeans, our um, fatigues. So it didn't matter if we got dirty, but um, they looked a mess when they, were, um, when they came in from uh, working with us. So I did that for a little while. And... Uh, I did a little security police augmentee work, and I was a volunteer for one year with the uh, base honor guard drill team um, and uh, burial detail. And I was also on the flying rifles drill team. So I did that for about a year. And I did some classified work. Classified and, in what way? It's classified. Can't tell me how. Okay. How long were you at Norton? Let's see. Um, well, I was in the Air Force four years, three months. Subtract nine months from that. So it was a little less than four years. Okay. Did you ever go overseas? Later. In the Air Guard. Is the Air Guard part of the Air Force? It's a component. Air Force uh, National Guard. Okay. So did you leave the Air Force from um, Norton? Uh, I was ripped out. Uh, do you know what rip means? Production of force. Right. I was uh, ripped out because I was in a non-critical career field and Vietnam was over and um, the government couldn't afford to keep everybody, so they had to uh, weed out those who were non-critical. Hence, um, I was um, I was given three more months at the convenience of the government to wait for Assad to open up to go to a missile mechanics school, but that didn't pan out, so I was um, involuntarily discharged. They give you a golden parachute, a nice handshake, and a few bucks. That was about it. Okay. <clears throat> no re-entry program. Uh, one day I was in uniform and uh, I was uh, at CBPO's uh, Consolidated Base Personnel Office. And um, it was on April the 1st when I went there, of all days. So I didn't believe it when I, t I was told there that I, I was being discharged. I thought it was all a, uh, just a joke, April Fool's Day joke until um, the clerk asked me for my ID card and then I saw him take out a scissors and uh, cut it into pieces and next thing I knew I was off base and um, uh, wondering where, where, what I would do next. Yeah, what did you do next? Um, I went to a realtor and made arrangements to, uh, to buy a house with my GI Bill and um, 
I had been dating someone, and uh, uh, her cousin, um, and her cousin, her cousin and her little boy uh, uh, had has had a room to rent at their place nearby the base. So I went to stay with them, and then my house cleared as for when I moved there. And uh, I worked uh, part time as a cocktail waiter. And um, just wasn't working out, so I moved back to Los Angeles and went to school. What was the impact you think serving four years had on you in the Air Force? <clears throat> well, I learned to be responsible. At uh, 20 years old, I was a sergeant, and I had people working underneath me, and I was responsible for them. And I was answerable uh, any time something went wrong during the, the work details that we did. And I had a lot of responsibility in uh, the classified work I did. And uh, I missed it. I missed the structure and I missed uh, the camaraderie. So where did you go to college then? 1978, uh, a year later, I went to Cal State LA. Okay. And um, I became a professional student. And I also went to uh, East LA College. Did you graduate eventually? No. Okay. No, I was too busy um, Cal State. Um, studying engineering and holding down two part-time jobs and a full-time job in the city of L.A. and going to school and um, frequenting the college pub. I was too busy doing all that to study. And I don't know how I, how I wound up with uh, 300 plus units. Wow, 300 units, he graduated. Uh, my, parent, my dad died in 86 while I was in school. And at that time I was in the uh, Air National Guard and uh, when he passed away, I um, had to help my mother with the family business. And then she passed away in 93. And uh, right before then, I had to drop out of school to help her. But I forgot to ask for a leave of absence. So when I got back to school, I was told, uh, guess what, you're no longer a se senior, you're now a sophomore, because you didn't ask for a leave of absence. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to go through all those um, engineering courses again and uh, repeat math courses and uh, science courses. So I decided to, uh, to just run the family business all alone for a couple of years. What was the business? Cemetery markers, and okay. selling, selling them and uh, I subcontract out and have uh, somebody else make the markers, granite, marble and bronze. And I was pretty much all alone because I, after my parents passed away, uh, my siblings uh, decided to stop helping and I was left all alone. And I drank too much and I burned out. So um, I let my sister run the business uh, while I moved out of town for a couple of years. Where'd you go? Minnesota, okay. St. Paul. And while I was there I joined the Army Guard and I worked um, part-time for um, manpower and then um, uh, let me see the um, I was living with uh, someone who was not only bipolar but she was also an alcoholic uh, big time and I tried keeping up with her drinking and uh, uh, I couldn't keep up with her and she finally got tired of me and uh, told me how to go to the VA, so I went to Minneapolis VA for a few months. And um, then from there I went to um, St. Cloud, Minnesota VA for about three months and then um, stopped in Phoenix to visit a family there. And um, I wanted back to Los Angeles. Are you still going to the VA now? Rarely. Okay. 
I uh, get all my medical attention, or pra well, practically all of it, uh, in the community. You mentioned you uh, had PTSD in your bio. Mm -hmm. yep. what, what was that from, do you think? Uh, things that happened in civilian life before I joined the service. And they were exacerbated by, um, by some things I had to do in the military. And from your classified things? Some. So as a result, uh, I have a um, small pension, but it's a VA pension. And now you've met Mrs. Wright, or Miss Wright, huh? Yeah. That's great. And uh, all the adversities, I went through all the setbacks I've, I've had. I'm, I'm pretty sure that if, um, if I had missed just one setback, uh, I wouldn't have made it on time to meet her. So it's an optimistic way of looking at it, I think. Where'd you meet? Country of Downing. Oh, okay. You've got a couple pictures of her, right? You want to show us? Where are those pictures? <clears throat> yeah. There we go. I bet if I put them up in front of the of the camera here, so we can have that part of your of your record here. Okay, for show it to me first. Okay. Uh, that's uh, her name is Anita Clark, yeah, Mary Anita Marie Clark, and um, <clears throat> she's in a hospital there. And um, there she is in the, the present hospital. She's uh, blonde, blue eyed, about five four, forty four years old now, and uh, she's a young, Irish German. A young one, huh? That's us. Uh, Irish, German, uh -huh. Scottish, and English. And I'll be 60 soon, and I couldn't talk her out of a relationship. Hmm, that's me. Tell about that. Oh. That's something on your nose there. That's um, sour cream. We were, uh, we were eating uh, baked potatoes and sour cream, and uh, we decided to put some sour cream in each other's noses. And, and there she is again. We went to Irvine, California, to um, through our church, to uh, help out um, inspecting shoe boxes full of presents for children for Christmas. Good laugh Christmas. there, huh? Yeah, I, I don't know remember what I said, but I said something funny. That's you with your gavel about, pipe, huh? About two years ago, um, on Halloween, uh, we went as uh, Ma and Pa Kettle. That's her um, without the pipe in her mouth. <laughs> I, I surmise that one. Yeah, that's me in a bell choir at church. I feel like Thor there holding these two huge hammers. It's a pretty big bell. You were blonder then, too. Right. Um, in the uh, Air Force, sometimes when I, when I didn't have shampoo, I'd use uh, ivory soap to wash my hair, and my hair stayed black. But uh, three years ago, uh, before I went to church, I didn't have time to run and get some uh, shampoo at the store. So I used a bar of ivory soap. My hair started going from brown to uh, red to blonde. Mm -hmm. And it took a while for it to grow out again, um, its original color. You want to show us those rings, too. What's the significance there? Well, On the left is her engagement ring, mm -hmm. and on the right is her wedding ring. She can't wear that ring in the hospital? Not in the hospital. Gotcha. Okay. And uh, this is my wedding ring. It's uh, sterling silver. Yeah. And um, I decided, all my own little self, that I'll only wear this ring one time, and that'll be at her wedding. And the rest of the time I'll wear a, a, a ring for daily wear. And it'll go in a prominent place in our house. So that if people ask about it, um, I'll just tell them that I only wore it one time because I'm only marrying one person ever. So uh, why wear it again? There you go. Well, it's a great story. I'm really glad having your, listening to your conversation for what you've done. And we, we thank you for your time in the service. and. Uh, for serving in the military and, and for supporting your country the way you do it. So I'd do you. it again. Uh, there's something I wanted to, um, I wrote down a couple of notes here. Sure. Um,
There's a phrase in uh, that song, um, America, Oh Beautiful for Gracious Skies. There's a phrase in there called liberating strife. And um, our armed forces, um, uh, that's, why, that's why we exist, to engage in liberating strife. And uh, uh, on the one side, uh, we engage in liberating strife as uh, agents of change. For instance, if there is an ally country and they want to uh, switch to democracy and uh, have the vote and uh, they're being uh, violently oppressed or they're being starved or in, in other ways uh, they're, they're being oppressed, uh, uh, our country is there to uh, help them. Uh, and another way, uh, the other side, agents of conformity or keeping things the way our uh, allies want them to be kept. If they're in a democracy and the leaders uh, want to switch to, um, to a more oppressive form of government and they don't want it, um, we'd be there at their request to um, help them to, to remain where they are and uh, to flourish. Maybe that sounds a little corny, but that's the way I feel. So, um, that being said, I'm, Good message. I'm glad I could do it and I'll do it again. Thank you very Thank much. You.